Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody. I'm Rachel Weinberg from the University of Cape Town, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today focused on traditional knowledge and the challenge of attribution of origin, including the question of who has priority over others for any benefits that are shared through access and benefit sharing measures. The webinar forms part of the Voices for Biojustice initiative and is co-convened by a number of organizations, including my organization, the University of Cape Town, Leeds University, People and Plants International, the City College of San Francisco, SPDA, and the Swift Foundation. We have a really fabulous group of presenters and panelists with us today, and an audience from all corners of the globe, and we're really looking forward to a dynamic and engaged conversation with you all. Our presenters and panelists um, include Graham Dutfield. Graham, I'm not sure if the videos are all on yet. I see. Yep, there we go. Um, Sarah Ives, Stembile Ndwandwe, who I think is, is um, having some technical problems joining, but will be with us shortly. Uh, and likewise, Alejandro Agomedo, who will be with us shortly. He's just having some technical issues, as well as Siva Tabisetti, who I see there. Before beginning our presentations, I'd like you just to run you through the program and note a few housekeeping rules. So we're going to be having two 15-minute presentations to start off with, um, from Graham and um, from Sarah. And we'll follow this up with a few shorter responses from a wider panel. Thereafter, we'll open up the discussion to questions from the audience to the panel. And if you have questions, please do type them in the, in the chat box, in the question and answer box. We can't promise we'll be able to respond to all of them because of time constraints, but we'll try our best and we'll respond to as many as we can. So please feel free also to email us to continue the conversation and to send us any comments that you may have on the policy brief that you would have received that accompanies the webinar. And that's also on the website if you, if you need to download it. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Graham Dudfield, who's Professor of International Governance in the School of Law at Leeds University. And I think Graham, somebody who needs very little introduction in the world of traditional knowledge and intellectual property rights. Um, he's been around a very long time. He's written many books on the issue. Um, and I think we all know him well. So Graham will be providing an overview of the topic and the challenges of attribution and origin. Over to you, Graham. Uh, thank you, Rachel. I hope uh, I'm audible. Um, Okay, my, my my task is is not to offer solutions. I'm the first speaker, so I'm going to raise the problems, and then hopefully uh, we'll move uh, towards ways forward. Right? Okay, so it's probably fair to say that access and benefit sharing hasn't been a huge success since the CBD, which is was 28 years old now, if you can believe that. Uh, TK holders certainly haven't seen a great deal of benefits come their way, so. I'm not going to go into every single possible explanation, uh, but I do want to focus on a couple, uh, or, uh, uh, well, actually three, uh, what I would perhaps somewhat uh, provocatively call naive assumptions that are very, um, uh, that are very persistent. And perhaps these assumptions rather get in the way. So the first assumption is that, is that traditional knowledge is attributable to a single abounded communities or countries. It has an origin. And the default position is the original holders are the first or the exclusive beneficiaries. The second is that the assumption is that TK, it remains the same, it's pure, it's unadulterated, and that is what makes it traditional. And the third uh, naive assumption is uh, that connecting holder beneficiaries with users is not problematic. It's it just make a deal, sign a contract, job done. All right, so what's wrong with these? Uh, well, first, the first one that it is generally attributable to, to, to a single sort of bounded community. It's, it's, it, it can be fixed, located to a time and a place. 
In fact, single origins are often impossible to identify and conventional narratives are often factually wrong. And I hope I'll uh, have time to give you one or two examples of this. In fact, the origin, seeking the origin may actually be, uh, be a distraction that actually gets in the way of finding a way forward in terms of giving the benefits of those who deserve them. The second, the assumption that it is pure it remains the same, and that's what makes it traditional. It's very important that we understand better uh, and perhaps learn to appreciate the way that knowledge mixes, it hybridizes, it gets transformed. There are creative additions and changes are made over time to at some point, origin, the basis for the benefit claim is going to encounter a set of other equally just claims, many not origin based, but maybe on having done something that was transformative. That will, and they, all these things will make highly complex figuring out who gets what. Uh, but benefits are bound to be fragmented in terms of distribution. The third assumption uh, that connecting holder, holder beneficiaries with users being a, a straightforward thing follows from the first two being naive or being uh, frequently uh, misleading or incorrect. So let's look at a couple of examples, two or three, if I have the time, to support the idea that benefit sharing schemes are likely to run into trouble if they are based on any of these assumptions. Right. The first one I'd like to talk about is one actually is probably somewhat known to many of us uh, because it's perhaps the first, the first ever biopiracy poster child, and that is the so-called Madagascar periwinkle. Um, so in the 50s and 60s, um, Eli Lilly, uh, the American drug company, uh, got patents or licensed patents or and acquired patents on uh, two anti-cancer products derived from this plant. It was treated as being a very simple biopiracy case, an open and shut case. Madagascar got nothing. Madagascar was ripped off. And I actually have in my hand, uh, this is a page from uh, uh, an issue of Science Magazine uh, dated 19th of June, 1992, which is, I think, about the week after the end of the Earth Summit uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And I'll just quote one, uh, one, one part of it. It says, in 1954, Lily phytobiologist Gordon Svoboda extracted the cancer phyto alkaloids in blastine and vincristine from the flower. By the time patents ran out, the drug company had rung up hundreds of millions of dollars in sales without ever paying Madagascar a dime. So what's the truth here? Well, the scientists, um, they were, and Eli Lilly with his interest, long interest in, in, in diabetes, uh, they were looking for um, for uh, anti-diabetic treatments, hence their, their search. And they did a literature search on ethnobotanical use in the Philippines. Another research group uh, directly acquired plant samples from uh, people in rural Jamaica. So Jamaica and the Philippines want a literature search, the other through direct contact. And this search... Uh, inspire them uh, eventually to come up with these, these anti-cancer drugs. So what does Madagascar have to do with Rosy Periwinkle? Well, I found an old book, well, old, 1977, uh, by someone called Morton called Major Medicinal Plants. It says the periwinkle is believed to be native to the West Indies, but was originally described from Madagascar. Described Madagascar, but native to the West Indies. And then you see med at medical uses going back many, many years in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, Central America, Colombia, India, Hawaii, Southeast Asia, Mauritius, and it goes on. Goes on. Right. So this is uh, a case where people assume the location is very obvious, uh, the injustice is very clear, the victims are very clear. In fact, 
who should get what and by what proportion is very, very hard to figure out. And I actually don't know the answer. Let me take another um, example, Neem. Now, um, in the 1990s, Neem, again, perhaps the second biopiracy poster child, if you look chronologically, Neem was assumed to be an Indian tree. And when companies got patents uh, on the use of Neem or Neem, um, at neem compositions uh, that could be used to treat, um, to protect plants from, from fungal infections. This was seen as being a very much a story about India, uh, Indian farmers being cheated, being ripped off uh, by the pirates. Again, a very clear, here are the victims, here, here, are, here are the pirates here. Well, perhaps they're pirates, and that's, that might be fair enough to say that. However, um, who are the victims here? Who should be getting benefits? Well, um, is it an Indian tree? Well, actually, um, biologists uh, with expertise in the area will say it, uh, it, it's native to an area spanning Afghanistan to Myanmar. It's not an Indian tree. The relevant traditional knowledge is mostly very commonly known and most unlikely to be bounded by the frontiers of modern India. And neem trees grow in other parts of the world. And no doubt, youth-related youth knowledge about neem is acquired there too. Some may overlap with that of Indian farmers, farmers in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Myanmar, or not. So neem-related TK is likely to stretch beyond the original range of the tree. Let me take a third example. And the third example is really more to do with um, uh, my second naive assumption about knowledge being somehow uh, fixed and, and pure, uh, and that it follows that the way that industry uses it is very sort of direct. Um, here's a TK, it's old, it's traditional, and here's a company that takes that knowledge um, and does something with it that's new, and then you have an invention. So you have knowledge here, product here. Nice and simple. Well, no, it's not. Uh, but actually, when you think about hybridity and mixing and transformativeness, it gets a lot more, I think, to the light, but actually a lot more sort of interesting. But it also it encourages you perhaps to be more creative, not to say, no, there are no benefits to be shared here, uh, there are no beneficiaries, but actually to think about this in a much more creative way, which I think we do need to do. So take the example of curare. Curare is perhaps well known to some as an arrow poison, uh, that uh, a plant-based arrow, arrow poison from South America. And Europeans uh, went around there and investigated it, brought it to Europe, and they found out that eventually that, um, that um, uh, it's not just useful as a product, because it causes paralysis, temporary paralysis, including of the breathing muscle. So it can be used in surgery. And um, in that sense, it's uh, the, act the active principle, which is toxic uh, when it comes to hunting, uh, is actually therapeutically useful when it comes to surgery. Now, I'll just read a, um, the dust cover of a book called From Poison Arrows to Prozac by Stanley Feldman, he says this, uh, where first he describes his arrow poison, and then so begins the incredible true story of the discovery of one of the most important substances in medical science. Heroi was to become the cornerstone of modern anesthetics, and the hands of the most eminent naturalists and scientists, it went on to provide the key to how we understand the human nervous system. It led directly to a host of drugs as diverse as Prozac, beta blockers, Botox, and diarrhea pills. And more recently, it's led to an understanding of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. That's a lot of, uh, of subsequent uh, uh, interesting, valuable, therapeutically uh, quite, quite astonishing um, things that came uh, from observation of people uh, producing and using this uh, mixture, plant mixture, as an arrow poison. So hence the point about mixing hybridity and transformation. 
Right? Kurari was a primary source, but there's massive cognitive and material distance between TK and what came after. So how do des sort of dessert-based arguments apply to share benefits? Again, I don't know, but we need to be, I think, a lot more creative. So just to finish off, uh, a couple of points to make, uh, which I hope will, will drive discussion. First, we need a serious rethink about benefit sharing. Ensuring fairness on the basis of quid pro quo, something for something, is fraught with complexities. And we need to embrace the complexities, otherwise we're not going to get anywhere. Second, we could start perhaps by actually visiting the word traditional in traditional knowledge and considering customary law norms as a possible way forward. The access and benefit sharing norms that we have put in place don't seem to work, reflecting a simplified perspective on a world that is largely fiction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham, for your very illuminating and provocative presentation which has raised, I think, some really important questions for us to consider, which we'll pick up in the, in the discussion. Um, but I wanted to move over to, to Sarah Ives, who's a lecturer in the School of Behavioral Sciences, Social Sciences and Multicultural Studies at the City College of San Francisco. She's researched these questions on the ground in South Africa with a focus on rooibos tea, which is a case that's been in the global spotlight lately because of a benefit sharing agreement that was negotiated between the rooibos industry and indigenous San and Khoi organizations. But as Sarah will explain, the case is perhaps a lot more fraught and complex than the media has revealed. So over to you, Sarah, to, to tell us about this case. Great, thank you, Rachel, and thank you for including me in this conversation. I'm gonna to talk today about traditional knowledge, access and benefit sharing, or ABS, and the complexity related to how these issues unfold when you place them in a specific context. And I think this is interesting in relation to some of the examples that Graham was using where the context or the place crosses borders, whereas Roibos is a very specific case where it really does exist in this one place. So it is deeply rooted to a place. The complexities really arise when we start talking about the people. So central to the ABS, is the goal of sharing the benefits that arise from genetic resources in a fair and equitable way. The idea behind many such agreements is to protect indigenous or traditional knowledge and the people and communities who hold this knowledge from bioprospecting. ABS agreements would ostensibly entitle communities to share the benefits that arise from commercial use. Yet mapping connections between natural products and genetic resources and ethnic groups can reveal both the hybridity of knowledge systems and past connections that were severed generations ago by colonial dispossession. So to place the discussion of traditional ABS, traditional knowledge and ABS in context, I'm gonna describe briefly um, the example of rooibos, right? This tea that you see in front of you right now. And part of the reason that I think that the rooibos example adds another dimension to this discussion is because it highlights those voices who are potentially silenced in the current approach to TK and ABS agreements. Now, I should note that I approach this issue from my perspective as an anthropologist who takes an ethnographic approach. In other words, my Research comes, comes from years of interviewing people in the Roibos region, living there, and participating in community events and activities. During this time, I heard the perspectives of people throughout the region and the industry, from farm workers and small-scale farmers to politicians and religious leaders, from community organizers to scientists, industry in insiders, large-scale commercial farmers, marketing professionals, and many more. I use an ethnographic point of view, view alongside my historical work to add to debates around TK. And I should note that I don't come from a legal or policy background. Roibos is a plant indigenous to a mountainous region, predominantly in South Africa's Western Cape. 
Over the last century, rooibos has transformed from a plant harvested for local use to what's been called South Africa's national beverage to an international commodity prized for its health benefits. It's exported today to more than 30 countries and rooibos is celebrated for its earthy flavor and its medicinal qualities. Now the list of the tea's purported wonders can appear endless and there's much scientific research going on to see which one of these um, can, can actually be verified. But according to some, rooibos will help you lose weight, control diabetes, it will promote longevity, make skin more youthful, cure acne, prevent cancer and Parkinson's disease, protect the liver, improve fertility, soothe colicky babies, promote sleep, provide emotional comfort, and more. Marketing materials describe it as a leading example of a global superfood. And in 2016, Time Magazine labeled rooibos one of the 50 healthiest foods of all time. So these exhortations have led to a swell of interest in the plant and its bioactive compounds. And today, rooibos accounts for about 10% of the global herbal tea trade. Now, indigenous San and Khoi peoples of Southern Africa were the early users of rooibos. Yet the well-documented genocide of San and virtual enslavement of Khoi and rooibos growing landscapes centuries ago was coupled with the dispossession of their land. Now, I should note that this dispossession did not stop the commercial rooibos industry from using Khoi and San imagery on marketing materials and tea boxes. In fact, one popular brand of rooibos is actually called Khoisan Tea, and the company uses rock art imagery to sell its wares. And you can see here in this photograph um, uh, some imagery of the rock art found in the rooibos region. The legacy of this history of dispossession means that today many who identify as San and Khoi are geographically disconnected from the plant. However, local knowledge played a key role in the development of the rooibos industry more than a century ago. And since 2010, indigenous San and Khoi organizers have worked to get the industry to recognize their role as primary knowledge holders. A 2014 government-sponsored report concluded that there was, quote, no evidence to dispute this claim and required rooibos industry to forge a benefit-sharing agreement with participating San and Khoi organizations. The rooibos industry entered into a series of negotiations with the South African San Council and the National Khoi San Council and their legal representatives a process that was facilitated by the Department of Environmental Affairs in South Africa. And in March 2019, a benefit sharing agreement was signed and there was much fanfare in the press um, around the world about this benefit sharing agreement. The agreement recognizes the role played by traditional knowledge in the development of the industry and allocates a quote TK levy calculated at 1.5% of the price that processors pay to farmers per, per kilogram of harvested rooibos. After being deposited into the government's bioprospecting trust fund, the levy is to be paid in equal parts to the San Council and the National Khoisan Council. Now, while clearly a TK can never erase colonial violence, representatives in the organization have expressed that the ABS agreement went a long way towards recognizing San and Khoi as peoples who possess a deep connection to the rooibos land. All too often, San and Khoi have been left out of the narrative, relegated to history or even described as extinct. And according to Cecil Lafleur, chair of the National Khoi San Council, beyond the monetary value of this deal, we celebrate the rooibos industry and the government that the rooibos industry and the government recognize the indigenous knowledge of the Khoisan people through rooibos. We regard this as an acknowledgement of our position in this country as being the first people who occupied the southern part of the continent. The rooibos story, however, does not end there. Colonial persecution in the region continued with apartheid policies including the relocation, disenfranchisement, and ongoing marginalization of local people labeled colored and black 
under apartheid classifications. Now, South Africa as a whole is classified as approximately 81% black, 9% colored, 8% white, and 2% Asian. A recent government census, however, described the rooibos growing region as about 80% colored, 15% white, and 5% black. Significantly, white residents comprise only 15% of the population. So they, the white population is 15% of the population in this region, but they own 93% of rooibos land. Small-scale farmers and farm workers remain largely landless, or they must rent land in order to cultivate. Now, knowledge of rooibos was largely lost by San and Khoi, who were forced to move thousands of kilometers away. Yet the knowledge was retained by the small-scale rooibos farmers and farm workers who remained. But these mixed-race descendants of former slaves, European settlers, and Khoi and San do not readily identify as indigenous. Instead, most claim and celebrate a, quote, colored or brown identity. Now, the National Khoisan Council highlights the colonial apartheid history of the term colored. They state that they have endured political and social discrimination due to being forcibly labeled colored under the 1950 Population Registration Act. They note that this label, alongside the concrete dispossession, attempted to erase their African identities. Getting official recognition of these erasures is one of the many reasons why Khoi and San claims to rooibos have had such enormous as, quote, hybrid. Many in the rooibos growing region who identify as colored express a strong sense that they are the original owners of rooibos knowledge because they believe their forebears were the original users of the plant because they have worked, lived, and loved the rooibos land for as long as their ancestral memories can trace. As one grower described to me, my heart is rooibos, my blood is in the soil. And even if they do not identify culturally as, as San or Khoi, most do recognize that they are San and Khoi descendants. Now, this local population has also contributed in numerous ways to the success of the rooibos industry as a commercial industry. These contributions include momentous discoveries by individuals such as Chinky Sparks, a woman who located the golden nests of rooibos seed in the 1920s and thus facilitated the industry's expansion. So whose knowledge counts in this complex dynamic context? Under the current rooibos ABS agreement, government recognized San and Khoi organizations are the sole beneficiaries. Small scale colored farmers and farm workers were largely left out of the negotiating process for compensation and eventually included only through the National Khoisan Council. These residents were labeled rooibos indigenous farming communities which are defined as rural farming communities in rooibos growing areas who consist of descendants of original Khoi Khoi peoples. Now they are to receive a portion from the trust set up for the Khoi people, although the exact proportion has not yet been determined. In order to receive their portion, however, it appears that they must go through a vetting process. First, they have to identify as part of a specific Khoi Khoi group and then they have to be accepted by that group. Now, the National Khoisan Council init describes initially reaching out to these, quote, ind rooibos indigenous farming communities in 2015, five years after the process began. However, in a meeting I attended in 2018, many small scale farmers were shocked to learn about the ABS. They had no idea these negotiations were happening and that they were not being included. As we talked during formal presentations and informal meals and tea breaks, many small scale farmers expressed that the government negotiations were not acknowledging their voices, their role in rooibos knowledge, or even their identities. 
Now, Rachel Weinberg has documented the feelings of one small scale farmer who said, to top it off, the Khoisan now declare that they want to benefit. Our people are the ones who collect the seed. Are we going back to the old South Africa where people are classed by race? I don't know where I belong, black, white, colored. Now, one person involved with the negotiations attempted to address some concerns when these farmers asked how they could get logistical support to be officially recognized as Roybo's traditional knowledge holders. He responded that they needed to contact the leadership of the National Khoisan Council. But we kept the Roybo's tradition alive, someone interjected. What about us? Because they lack bureaucratic experience, lobbying power, monetary resources, and legal assistance of the San and Khoi organizations, small-scale farmers remain marginalized and their voices unheard. Moreover, in a bureaucratic twist, these same small-scale farmers are now required to pay the 1.5% levy to San and Khoi organizations, leading to a great deal of conflict. Yet the complicated Roibos story does not end here either. Those whose voices remain perhaps the most silenced in this discussion appear to be the farm workers. The distinction between farmer and farm worker can be blurry and dynamic in the Rodbus grown region. Some small scale farm workers or, or farmers worked on white commercial farms in addition to tending their own crops or had worked on commercial farms before accessing their own land. These farmers have friends, family members, and fellow church members who are workers. At the same time, many farm workers have lived and worked for generations on the same commercial farm and express a sense of cultural ownership of rooibos and its knowledge similar to that of the small scale farmers, despite their economic dependence on white farm owners. They felt alienated from the fruits of their labor, but not from their embodied relations with the plant and the soil or from their ancestral connections with rooibos knowledge. During my time in the region, I spoke with a government employee who was supposed to interact with farm workers as part of his job. But he said, it's not easy to reach the workers. You first need to contact the owners. White farmers, he said, controlled workers' housing and many aspects of their lives. And while I've spoken with a labor organizer, few options appear to exist currently for farm workers to make themselves heard. And many farm workers feel doubly vulnerable because of the high levels of unemployment in the area, leading to yet another silenced voice in relation to ABS, unemployed and unhoused former farm workers. Despite their ancestral connections to the land, where do they fit in the ABS TK equation? So I want to return once more to the question, whose knowledge counts in this complex dynamic context? And I want to add two other questions. Even if the voices of small scale farmers who are currently marginalized in the Roibos ABS are able to obtain the resources to organize, does the current framing of the TKGR and its emphasis on a particular understanding of tradition allow for claims by those who identify as quote colored or brown and not as Khoi and San? Does it allow for claims by farm workers, the unemployed and the unhoused in the region? Now the politics of traditional knowledge can appear to become a matter of policing, not only of ownership and belonging, but also a matter of policing memory, history, what counts as evidence and who counts as traditional. The Roibos ABS has been hailed as a success um, by some as a long awaited example of how indigenous peoples can benefit from ABS. And the ABS has prompted new conversations about identity, history, and colonial and apartheid legacies in the Roibos growing region. Yet the case also raises key unresolved questions about the ownership of knowledge and the uncritical conflation of ABS with social and economic justice, particularly in relation to those who lack bureaucratic know-how or other resources to make their voices heard, as the example of Roibos farm workers highlights. Thank you, and I look forward to a discussion of these ideas.
Thank you so much, Sarah, for bringing your depth of knowledge to this topic and for opening up new conversations about this case. I think we could probably have a webinar on this case alone, given the multiple issues it raises linked to identity, to dispossession, and the sometimes inadvertent impacts of ABS that I think we haven't really explored thoroughly. So I'd now like to call on our, our panel to respond to some of these inputs. Um, Stembele Ndwandwe is a researcher at the University of Cape Town, currently doing doctoral work on honeybush tea, which like rooibos has both a long history of use and is also the subject of ongoing ABS discussions. And Stair has spent many months working with communities associated with honeybush in the Langkloof area of the, of the Southern Cape in South Africa. And the question I would like to pose to her is, what does ABS implementation in relation to traditional knowledge look like on the ground with these communities? What are, you, what are the critical issues that are emerging from, from your experiences, Steph? Over to you. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I've been doing research uh, focusing on the participation and inclusion of marginalized groups in the honeybush trade. So honeybush is basically a plant that is used pr primarily to produce tea. So in the region where I'm conducting my research, uh, the locals have traded honeybush informally for years. And then in the past 20 plus years um, or so, the trade got formalized with many changes, which um, included uh, the introduction of different state regulations. And one of the recently introduced regulation is the access and benefit sharing, which um, I think Sarah has just described beautifully now. Um, so now different role players um, in the long loop, they generally welcome an APS principle that says the users of Honeybush must do right by the original um, knowledge holders. Um, but there has been a dissatisfaction with how the whole APS is implemented because it has come as a sort of an imposition from government. Um, and you find that there is not much consideration given as to how the, in, the APS introduction actually affects marginalized groups differently. Um, so the marginalized groups I am talking about here, or in this case, they are predominantly a group of generational farm workers or just farm workers. Um, who live in different segments and because of different segment, pa segment patterns and other factors, um, they have somewhat kept different context regarding their relationship with honeybush, um, whether as a plant or as knowledge. Um, so therefore, even though they are all in the same region and marginalized by colonial and apartheid systems, their response to APS when it comes to their communities takes different routes. For example, there is this community. Um, their community was formed as far back as the 1800s. Um, they've lived with honeybush, they worked honeybush, and they've contributed tremendously to honeybush tea production. So because of that connection, when they engage with APS, um, they will be glad that some justice is being done, but they would want to know if they have to assign with a certain identity in order to benefit, if they are a co-op but not part of the original owners of the knowledge, do they need to pay royalties? Um, so basically, they will ask questions that will help them demystify this unnecessary mystery that comes with APS when it lands into communities that host these indigenous plants. And then there is this other community, um, which is about 25 kilometers away from the one that I just presented. This community, because for years they have been living on commercial farms and only started forming their community about five years ago. Um, 
they know about the plant, but most of them do not have a practical use or a deep connection with honeybush, even though they may know that their ancestors used honeybush. So for this kind of a community, um, like they, uh, they might benefit from the APS law as they can clean from a, the collective identity and original knowledge from those who are able to keep contact with honeybush plant and knowledge, which for them, they couldn't. Um, so in closing, I think the problem or contentions have arised where the APS then conceptually treats the, like the beneficiaries as homogeneous, which is seldom a reality because you find that um, even if they are 25 kilometers apart from each other um, and they see the same mountains, or they are of the same identity group, they exercise distinct uh, temporal demands or just demands, and they should be allowed to exercise those demands without displacing the other or having demands that get sacrificed uh, for the ones that make the industry share the benefits in a less messy way. Um, so prioritizing those who are original owners of knowledge, I will say, should not be frowned upon because it does have its place, but it should not further marginalize the groups back into the corners that colonization and apartheid laws has put them on, all in the name of helping the natural product sector get people that they can share benefits with. Um, so I think if we don't take time or if, our, if the APS policies do not take time to deal with the complex marginalities that the beneficiaries find themselves in, the winner remains the same racially structured economic production system. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so I, much, Dear. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dear, for these really insightful reflections. I mean, ABC, ABS is so often an abstract concept sitting in policy fora or in sort of dusty government offices. And hearing from these experiences is a really important reality, reality check, I think, for us all. And another person who's very firmly located on the ground is, is Alejandro Agomedo. Um, I don't know, Alejandro, if you've managed to join. Um, I'm hoping you are here. Um, Alejandro, let me introduce him and hope he can connect. Uh, he's the Andes Amazon lead at the SWIFT Foundation. And he's a long-term indigenous activist working on supporting indigenous food systems in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Um, uh, Alejandro, are you here? I don't see him. I wanted to ask Alejandro a question about digital sequence information, but let's um, let's try and get him on. And in the meantime, I think I'll move to to Siva um, while we try and connect Alejandro. Um, so Siva is associate professor of intellectual property law in the law department at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Siva's. Um, Siva's a very lively person who I think has has often said that um, ABS, that her words were, is a tired trope <laughs> and that we really need to start thinking much more laterally and creatively about ABS and how we implement social justice. So I wanted to know if Siva could give us some idea of what the next 10 to 20 years might look like in terms of international law. You know, are there some broad principles that we could start thinking about? Uh, and what this might mean also for existing institutions like the World Intellectual Property Organization that spent many years looking at these questions. So that's over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Rachel, very much for that introduction and um, also for parachuting me into the conversation um, and what an interesting conversation this is. Um, I think what your policy brief does so well is to capture a moment in time it's this moment that traditional knowledge is going through um, international law and domestic law. Um, but I think I, I'd like to address my comments to um, the story of traditional knowledge, the sort of the arc of traditional knowledge. 
um, and its trajectory, where it where it sort of originates from and where it's going. And I'll try and do that in the sort of four and a half minutes um, left to me. Um, so I want to make uh, two points and then I'll end with um, what I think might be a way forward. I think the first um, uh, point that jumps out at me, both from the policy brief and the very rich discussion um, that the um, speakers have just, um, um, who've gone before me, have just uh, spoken about, is the origin of traditional knowledge. Um, so traditional knowledge is sort of uh, modeled on intellectual property law, right? And I think there are many reasons, looking back now, why this was a mistake. Um, so things like origin, attribution, prior art um, are firmly rooted in intellectual property discourses. Um, and they have a, a particular framing there and a particular history of how they develop. And I think, and, and it's not surprising to me that there are problems now in transporting this into something like traditional knowledge. Um, and also there are other issues such as the difference between or the split between access and utilization. Now this is something IP deals with a lot because IP regards uh, the raw material as not being where the innovation happens. Um, and so this split with access and utilization also does not bode well for ABS contracts. And I think above all, um, intellectual property law is transactional. Um, so the emphasis on ABS contracts as a modality of achieving fairness and equity uh, is, I think, that comes, it, it, it's the flavor of IP that we're trying to bring into uh, TK. Um, so I, I don't find it surprising uh, that there are real problems in implementation of these ideas when it comes to traditional knowledge. The second point I'd like to make, uh, Rachel, because you raised the question of international institutions um, such as WIPO, uh, and I noticed that there are uh, quite a few people on um, participating in this webinar who might be better placed to speak to this than me. But what occurs to me is that we can't think of institutions as single entities any longer. Um, around many of these issues, they work as regime complexes. So there's a great deal of institutional density of different institutions with different governance objectives working on the same issue. So there's, there's partial overlap. And in most cases, there is no hierarchy which means we keep going around in circles without finding a way out. There's no exit strategy or there's no strategy for a resolution. And I think um, DSI, Digital Sequence Information, for instance, is a prime example um, uh, of an issue that is really caught up in a regime complex. And if you <laughs> to it, I can maybe come back uh, with, with a few points to it. So what follows from regime complexes? At least two things. Uh, one, as I mentioned before, uh, organizations like WIPO have particular institutional objectives that they need to fulfill, and therefore other objectives are subordinated. Um, it also reads, leads to a particular way of resolving problems, which is bounded rationality, in the sense that, sense that new thinking or new framing is very hard to come by. For both of these issues that I've mentioned, uh, one way forward, I think perhaps, uh, you know, I think when you're in the middle of the undergrowth in the forest and you're cutting away, slashing your way to find a, a route out of it, I think we need to look up and see the blue sky. And for me, I find it odd that we have not been able to move fair and equitable forward as a principle of international law. So all of this attention that's being put poured into ABS contracts, remember, it's only a modality. It's a means of achieving fair and equitable outcomes. So I would like to see a lot more thinking around what fair and equitable would mean as a principle of international law. So it would be open texture, um, meaning we could give it content based on lateral regimes such as UN Sustainable Development Goals or human rights. Um, it would be open texture and therefore allow us to look at unprecedented situations. So perhaps we would move away from IP and start looking at trade, for instance, or other issues that might fall under a broad umbrella or of what might be fair and equitable in particular uh, context. So for the next 10 years, I would like to see new thinking because I think traditional knowledge is ready to move on to a second, third generation articulation of what's going on and how we achieve 
um, equitable outcomes. But I would really emphasize that this new thinking must be based on a good understanding of what I would call the chessboard nature of issues around traditional knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Those are very inspiring words to, to take us forward towards some solutions, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think we have managed to get Alejandro in. Alejandro, are you here? Yes, I am here. You are here. Okay, we can't see you, but we can hear um, you. So that's be that's better than nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Alejandro, I thought it'd be really interesting to ask you about the implications of so-called digital sequence information for traditional knowledge holders. I see there are a couple of questions coming through the, the chat line around DSI as well. And as many will know, the informational component of genes has become increasingly important due to the possibility of storing genetic sequence data as digital information and using this information to create proteins, molecular processes, and even new organisms. Mm. Um, and the inclusion of DSI within AABS policy, as we know, is currently a major stumbling block in multiple UN processes, from the Convention on Biodiversity through to the Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources and the so-called BBNJ negotiations concerning the high seas. So given this increased attention, I, I wondered if you could give some reflections on what this might mean for the rights of traditional knowledge holders and the ways in which knowledge and information are valued. Uh, thank you, thanks, Rachel, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not at um, technological, technologically um, um, uh, good at it, but um, I'll... I'll answer your question. Um, well, first of all, um, let me uh, reflect on um, um, a couple of things before I go straight into the um, DSA uh, question. Um, you have mentioned that this the, the ABS policy has been um, out there for um, almost 30 years and it's uh, you know a key pillar of the CVD and it hasn't worked so by extension it means that the CVD is not working secondly um, uh, Graham has, men has mentioned that perhaps we've been um, you know acting within a, f a fictional context and I fully agree. I think this fiction has been built on uh, a narrative that has as a, as a, its main pillar, uh, Western law. And Western law that <clears throat> represents co a colonial history and a uh, <clears throat> you know the uh, extraction and the commodification of uh, of nature that we uh, are, are seeing uh, now um, with more force through um, you know, this, the so-called um, you know nature-based solutions uh, and and the like, and I think uh, ABS um, in all it, its existence so far has only um, created more problems for biodiversity conservation and has, uh, in fact, eroded more the rights of indigenous peoples and traditional knowledge holders. It has created a whole wave of biopiracy around the world that has not been solved. And I don't think any um, construction and a juridical construction will resolve this if it continues to be built in the law of the oppressor. So I don't think that um, uh, there is um, a way out with the uh, current system. And I think no matter how much we discuss issues of ABS and 
traditional knowledge and associated intellectual property, this is not going to be solved. And in terms of DIS, and here we're talking about um, information that um, is being sequenced, um, but that derives from uh, genetic material that work uh, in many cases created by indigenous peoples, uh, call it at seeds or call it other types of um, plant materials that um, um, have co-evolved uh, with indigenous peoples. And now this information is obviously producing uh, commercial products and again is being uh, appropriated by the same people that um, um, you know, have uh, power and control over the legal systems. And uh, uh, with the sequencing of um, <laughs> information, a digital sequencing of information, I think we are facing uh, a very dire situation which puts uh, indigenous peoples' uh, survival um, into um, into uh, um, you know um, into uh, or challenges the survival of indigenous peoples, while uh, the physical material um, that is being um, dealt with, with with access and benefit sharing laws. Um, the, the sequencing of information is not covered within this, uh, these laws, access laws. So uh, abuse and piracy are starting to pile up as you uh, seen um, in the cases that were um, um, <clears throat> denounced uh, within the international treaty, uh, the FAO International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources. And I don't think this is going to be solved either if we go uh, through this, um, you know, um, one way, one way approach, which is to keep building new laws to um, to create, uh, um, you know, this fiction of benefit sharing and equity, which is not going to happen because, you know, on one hand, you have indigenous peoples that have a worldview on uh, where you know humans are part of nature, so you cannot commodify um, uh, those elements that constitute nature. And probably in the past, um, you know, and we see how now in in uh, in the U uh, in the U.S. this is uh, just um, um, brewing um, <clears throat> the um, you know the movement for. Um, um, ras uh, racial justice. Uh, the law has has applied to that and uh, applied to humans in the same way. Um, uh, you know, um, now is being applied to uh, our relations to other elements of nature. So there's a big clash of worldviews here. People that want to commodify the sacred, commodify nature and might profit out of that, and indigenous peoples that would like to continue a relationship with nature that is more nurturing and that produces, um, you know, um, more um, <clears throat> uh, equitable relationship in that, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> in, in this case. So, um, in terms of DIS, um, again, I think um, we are walking into a um, quite a, um, um, a critical situation. Um, I'm not sure what are the uh, um, uh, the the responses that we can uh, provide uh, at the international level. I have no trust there, but. Uh, indigenous peoples themselves and local communities themselves can develop their um, information systems to protect um, their knowledge and do organize their own databases, um, organize the, uh, the, <clears throat> the taxonomies 
um, so that they, they, it serves communities, it serves peoples, and it's not just for selling. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro, for these important contributions. I think these are issues that haven't really received much prominence in wider ABS debates, especially with regard to the sort of the marketization, the commodification and the dematerialization of biodiversity and knowledge. And in the context of DSI, I think these challenges of attribution and origin become even even trickier. So so we have a long we have a long way ahead. But thanks very much for, for your very um, thought-provoking contributions. We've had, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of activity in the chat room, which is really fabulous. I think not only questions, but also engagements between people. Uh, I think that's one of the advantages of webinars, that they sort of, they encourage that possibly more. These are the sort of the tea time breaks to, to seem to take place in the, the chat room. So do have a look at that. But there are some specific questions um, for the panel. And um, I won't have a chance to go through all of them, but I just wanted to, to pull out some of the ones that are coming through. Perhaps for you, Graham, to start off with, um, there, there are a lot of questions from Preston Hardison. I, I don't think we can answer all of them. But he's asking um, that the WIPO discussions are predominantly centering on the three dimensions of protection, benefit sharing and attribution with a heavy emphasis on, on benefit sharing and attribution and standard copyright like exceptions and limitation in the public domain. He's asking whether ABS can accommodate these, these kinds of questions. Um, and I wondered if you could respond to that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um Actually, Preston did raise a couple of, uh, of things which I, which I have both read. Um, the trouble with WIPO is that it is a specialised agency in the United Nations dedicated to IP, to intellectual property, and therefore it, it, uh, it deliberately uh, shuns human rights, um, largely shuns, has to shun sort of uh, things like customary law. And it does, of course, you know, it, it does... Uh, it does mean that it's a very uh, a very reductive d d discussion, and I think personally, I think it's probably actually run its course in terms of, of how useful it actually is. Um, I actually would agree with, with Preston that there are much wider issues that just can't be reduced to this in the same way as can't be reduced to tax assets and benefits sharing. Um, so that separation of, of, of TK from other issues is highly problematic. And I'm just reminded of Darrell Pose's uh, uh, traditional resource rights, which is about integrated rights so that you can, you can uh, pursue certain ones in certain forums, but make sure holdbacks so to, to deploy those other, other demands, those other issues, those other areas of debate in other places. Uh, so if we are only going to discuss the subject at WIPO, we're only going to discuss it uh, under the CBD, uh, we are reducing a lot of what's really important to Indigenous peoples and, uh, and other communities. There's also a question uh, about hybridity. Um, as, as two people uh, um, queried this, um, I think hybridity is actually very common. It is a natural phenomenon. Uh, I wouldn't prejudge whether instances of hybridity uh, relate to, dis to dispossession um, Although, or and violation of customary law, although I do think they often do, uh, but I can't be judged. You have to look actually case by case. Um, okay, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Graham, for jumping into the next question. I was I was going to ask you. So Sorry. that's great. <laughs> um, there's some questions around the Roybos case um, in terms of why it's an ABS case. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's quite useful to reflect on. I think a, a couple of people mentioned, isn't this a commodity we're dealing with? So so why is Robos ABS? Um, I suppose I, I could just chip in briefly to say that it's, I mean, the, the case centers around the, the knowledge component rather than the resource component. But even having said that, it's it's a case that that's retrospective. So I think it does raise some questions about whether this 
sits squarely within the ABS framing or not. Um, Sarah, I, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about the Robles case, especially since it has come from the aspect of knowledge, right, is that the the very groups who are um, discussing that, that, that are, are making the claim for that knowledge, right, are people who have been dispossessed of that land for, you know, um, more than 100 years. So they're not actually even making a specific claim that they actually still currently have the knowledge, is that they they lived in this area and that that knowledge essentially was taken from them when they were dispossessed. So I think that adds a sort of extra layer of complexity when you're talking about knowledge is, you know, what what counts as knowledge? Is it current knowledge? Is it knowledge that you weren't able to have? what knowledge even means in this case? Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, I wondered if we could um, go to some of the questions around, the, there are a couple around bias, uh, bicultural protocols that have been raised um, by several participants. Um, Alejandro, I think you've had some experience with bias, bicultural protocols. The questions here are, where do they fit in? Can, are, they, are they useful for these sorts of situations? Have they been useful? Do they have, do they have a place? Yes, I think they have a place if it's used um, for um, reclaiming uh, uh, rights, I think, rather than for ensuring um, trade or uh, <clears throat> facilitating access. Um, in our experience, um, these protocols, if they are built upon, upon customary laws, then they have an inherent um, attribute of um, balancing the different types of um, needs of, of the community that um, want to develop the, the protocol. And if it's directed to um, reverse this um, access, so rather than allowing people to come to access, um, what we did was knock the door of a gym bank and ask them to give us back what was taken unlawfully from the communities. So we developed a um, agreement uh, with a gym bank by which the gym bank um, gave back or rematriate or repatriate uh, um, a large number of potatoes um, that were uh, they were holding um, from which communities didn't benefit. And the gene bank uh, also agreed to recognize that the intellectual property uh, rights of those materials were vested on the communities and no on the gene bank. So to do this negotiation, we based uh, the rules uh, of engagement and um, all the attributes of the relationship in cost money laws. And I think, um, uh, at the local level, in this particular case, um, it worked fine because um, we recovered um, close to 450 varieties of potatoes that increased the diversity of the, um, of, of the local farms farming system and created opportunities to develop micro enterprises based on those materials that were um, that were uh, repatriated. So it means that, um, you know, you can't, you can't uh, use this uh, models in a, in a different way and not just to, uh, you know, to sell um, and uh, make a commodity of your knowledge or your resources, but rather enrich your system and create opportunities for the community to develop their own regenerative uh, um, economy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alejandro. I believe people are having some some technical difficulties, so I'm sorry about that. Apparently, if you refresh your your screen and sign back in, um, it it won't freeze. But um, it, it is recorded, so for people who want to to go back to the bits they've missed, you can you can do that on the website. Um, there's a question about uh, the apparent disjuncture between. Uh, sort of private property rights and knowledge that is innately communal or generational. Um, this is coming through from Jen Whittingham, from Jessica Lavelle, who's talking about the junctures between considering benefits for providers versus profits for users. And I think sort of this overall, these different worldviews that come into play. Siva, I wonder if you, if you could comment on that. Um, is there a mismatch? Is it is it feasible to put these elements together and find a solution? Um, to find a solution via ABS, I don't think so. I you know contracts are difficult to enforce, and international contracts are even more difficult to enforce. And, and I think when if we restrict the conversation to ABS contracts as a modality of achieving equitable outcomes, then we're we're forever going to be struggling to address. Uh, these fundamental questions like, you know, whose knowledge, um, how is this knowledge generated, how does it develop, um, in whose interest is it to exploit the knowledge. So um, uh, Jessica Lavelle's question about, um, you know, is this about token benefits where there's a disjunction between benefits for providers but profits for users, um, you can go back to the structure of a contract to answer that question because um, in many cases during the negotiation process, it makes more sense to accept a small amount upfront rather than uh, forego the immediate benefit in return for the long term speculative, but perhaps larger benefits down the line because you don't have a way of monitoring the performance of that contract, or at least it's a process that requires a lot of legal and economic resources. So, so all of these questions, um, you know, are, are you know you're trying to answer them through a modality that is transactional, and we know that much of traditional knowledge and the way it it arises is not transactional in the same sense. So we could either try to continue fitting, uh, uh, you know, um, fitting uh, a square peg through a round hole, or we could take a step back and say ABS is one modality in which we do this, but there has to be other ways of looking at this. And I think this is also the point about the, the commons question, um, because again, uh, IP pushes us to talk in terms of absence of property or presence of property or in terms of ownership. Uh, and again, this is a concept that doesn't sit very easily within many of these communities. So perhaps it's time for those who are working with traditional knowledge, such as the wonderful panel uh, today that's working on the ground to develop new vocabulary and reframe this issue. Um, and I, I think one of the things I, I, I wanted to mention with regime complexes is that one of the ways to tackle the problems that arise from regime complexes is to reframe the issue, to use the insider's language in order to give a fresh way of looking at old issues. Um, and I'm afraid I don't think ABS is the way forward. ABS contracts is the way forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Siva. So as we start wrapping up the webinar, I, I wanted to give each panelist an opportunity just for you know, one or two minutes of reflection on, on what we've heard. Um, you know, if there's, if there's one thing that we need to work on over the next five to 10 years, what do you think that is? Graham. Okay. Um, well, first, actually, I wanted to respond to what to something uh, um, somebody uh, said about the uh, traditional knowledge digital library in India, because I think actually this is quite a central uh, point, saying that should we make this knowledge open, should we make it commons? Um, now, it's important, I think, to be aware that the Indian digital library uh, on traditional knowledge is uh, actually public domain knowledge published in books. I went to the office where they're doing it, entering data from books. This is well-documented knowledge. 
Uh, that's, of course, that is in the public domain. And that's why it's being used to defeat novelty claims in patent applications. In fact, uh, we have no right to make digital knowledge uh, commons. Uh, it, you ha it, it's up to the people who have the knowledge. Uh, and also, you know, that indigenous communities have their own customary legal orders, which we must respect. Uh, so it's nothing to do with, with whether we think it should be commonly available to everybody or not. It's actually um, up to them. And that uh, leads to my point that um, anything that we come up with, and I think uh, um, I, I think Mahop asked me um, to, to sort of be optimistic, right? Uh, not just look for problems, but also work towards solutions. And um, it's perhaps a cliche, but solutions are, are going to be most effective when the people who are supposed to benefit from them actually own them. They have a sense of ownership in these rules. ABS laws, it's very hard for them, uh, for local people to feel that we own these laws. They're ours. We helped to frame them, to devise them. Um, these are international norms that we try to localize, but it's very, very hard to do. Maybe things have to go the other way rather than, um, um, it, 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 um, localized globalism. We need to move towards globalized localism. Okay. I think I'll just mm -hmm. end. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Sarah. Yes, I mean, my head is, is swirling with things right now. And I think this has been a really helpful panel, especially with all the different kinds of perspectives that have been brought, brought to it. And I think one of the things that, that sort of remains so clear to me is, is recentering this idea of equity and asking whether and how the ABS is actually achieving that goal. And I think it goes back to, again, these silenced voices, right? Whose voices are we hearing? in ABS frameworks, who, whose voices are we even hearing in biocultural protocols? It tends to be the voices of those that have the bureaucratic support, the bureaucratic knowledge and, and know-how. And then thinking also about how this sort of international framework plays out in local levels, both local in terms of the place itself, but even within a particular country's history. And as we saw, right, um, so well articulated in the honeybush example as well, is you know, in South Africa, the risk of some sort of reinforcing some of those racial kind of categorizations um, that, that um, were created under apartheid. Um, and I think when you really look at um, the rebels context, if you think about the ABS and what it's done, and certainly um, the ABS has been very important for the San and Khoisan councils, and, you know, and they, they've, they've spoken about how important it was for, for them to be recognized as a people Right, and as a people who had a connection to this place. But if you actually look at the place itself, the rooibos growing community, the rooibos growing region, there really has been no fundamental change. The land is still in the same hands. The farm workers are still in the same situation they were in. Um, and if anything, now we see the small scale farmers also having to pay an additional levy. Um, so these are people who are just barely squeaking by now um, having to pay an additional an additional um, levy on their work. And so, you know, I think um, placing that point of equity at the forefront, placing it in specific contexts, um, and I think, you know, really, as, as, as Siva was saying, kind of rethinking the entire kind of approach to ABS and to, to the concept of traditional and the concept of traditional knowledge um, with that goal in mind. So those are sort of the things that I think are, are, are really in my mind after those presentations today. Thank you, Sarah. Alejandro, are you still there? Could you give us sort of one or two minutes of reflection and, and thinking ahead? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think uh, um, my reflection goes towards um, how to work um, or how badly we need legal pluralism in here, so that the different um, um, legal systems of communities can play a role and can drive this type of interactions 
because um, within um, uh, you know different cultures, those legal systems have um, inherent rules that um, you know uh, create the type of balance and the type of relationship that uh, we need. So legal pluralism would be, uh, I think, uh, one way forward. The second uh, point is, um, you know, the rates of nature. And I think there's more and more, um, I think, um, effort towards uh, the recognition um, um, you, or, or to go beyond human rights and to recognize that also plants and animals, all the relations have rights. And what's going to happen uh, if that, um, you know, becomes a reality, this will be a, a, a different topic. Um, so um, while, um, you know, we still are discussing um, how to uh, trade for diversity, we are losing it so fast that, um, you know, the cultural um, and biological diversity, of, as we know, um, in, in the near future won't be the same. And so, as um, uh, Graham has said, you know, we may be, um, you know, um, continue to uh, push this fiction that um, and we had to stop. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alejandro. Stay, are you there? Would you like to? I don't so much sure if you've managed to yes. join. You are there. Yes. Could yeah. you give us a minute or two of your reflections? Yes. And think, I think yeah. um, I will just expand on the serious rethink of uh, benefit sharing um, that Graham raised. And um, I think part of it will be really interesting of like, there is profit or users, they are users, they are extracting and producing, and then um, the communities who are usually in the global south are the benefiting sort of like providers. And with that, like it is such like when I when I was doing my research um, in the communities, it is like such violence to say that a person that was dispossessed uh, through being relegated to cheap labor, that part of the monetary, uh, part, of, part of the non-monetary benefits that they can get is uh, being a worker, which is paid um, such a, like, cause usually like the marginalized groups, they end up finding themselves at the bottom of the value chain of these natural products. So it, 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 it's, to me, rethinking that uh, because it, it, it's, it's, it just maintains them at this edge of marginality. And I agree with uh, the suggestion to reframe the issues using the new vocab from the communities or even like borrowing the if the different theori theoretical lenses that we have been used as researchers in, in, in dealing with how everyone who is involved in the natural product sector can um, work together and benefit in a just way. Thank, thank you very much, there. Siva, the last word. Uh, oh no. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think uh, so. I, I, I'll say two things. I think um, this has been, you know, a really, really uh, rich um, hour and a half. I think first thing I would say is, um, as you mobilize yourself for the next ten years, put as much distance as you can. Uh, from the normative language around IP and traditional knowledge. Um, IP centers around things like individual effort, uh, property, uh, concepts of reward, 
which I think does not really work very well in TK. And there are many ways in which you could do this, sort of establish the sort of um, uh, the normative distance between TK and IP. And there are many academics who've done an excellent job of doing this. But I find that uh, domestic critiques um, that, that's in the academic literature, for instance, does not really filter up towards international organizations very well. So maybe part of the effort needs to be to take some of that language and float it upwards uh, towards these international fora where they can actually get hardened into more equitable uh, norms. And then my last point, and I want to take from your excellent policy brief, um, where you raise the possibility of multilateral action and multilateral initiatives. Um, so is there a place for multilateralism if there are regime complexes? What is the way forward? Uh, if most of international cooperation is about regime complexes and institutional density, then how do you cut through? Um, and I think, uh, you know, from my uh, limited experience of um, taking part in uh, the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction um, negotiations uh, as an obs academic observer, I think it's really important for low power uh, nations and groups to articulate detailed and coherent uh, proposals. Um, find your allies, form small groups multilaterally rather than large groups. Um, so that you can articulate clear consensus positions and put these uh, proposals on the table. So it forces others to then think of it in the language that you have used. And I think we need to start seeing more of that. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. And thank you so much to everybody for your very active and vibrant participation today. It's, I think it's been a really, really energized session. And I'd, I would especially like to thank Gabriela Alvarez for her tireless work behind the scenes to help make this happen, to our esteemed present presenters and panelists for their very fabulous inputs, and to all of you, the audience, for your active participation. Um, the, this has been recorded. It will be available for those who haven't managed to, to see it or who had technical glitches in between. And I'd also like to announce that we'll be holding a further webinar on the 24th of June at 3 p.m. EST, titled Bringing Voices of Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities into Global Arenas. And we'll be sending out a flyer for this over the next few days, so please do register. And we look forward to ongoing engagements with you all. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>